7mm Weatherby Load Development. So I've got a couple comments here on YouTube asking me to do a um, video on load development for the 7mm Weatherby. <laughs> I'm not too sure how helpful I'm going to be on that. Um, I don't really have I have my loading stuff here, but I won't I won't be reloading any um, live rounds or anything. I don't really have a need to right now. I don't really have a full set to go by um, to load. So I guess I'll talk a little bit a little bit more about the rifle itself and um, a little bit about its history, I guess, for the people that are interested. Uh, a lot of my friends say that I'm an old soul, I guess, <laughs> a little bit old school. So um, I'm a fan of the classics. I got quite a bit of old stuff here sitting on my desk, stuff that's been handed down to me. And um, I guess I just appreciate um, stuff from times that's gone by. So uh, this 7mm Weatherby was uh, a gift to me by my opa. Uh, who was raised in West Germany during the Second World War and he immigrated to Canada. Uh, his family was fleeing Germany and um, when the Russians invaded they did a lot of really ugly stuff um, to a lot of the Germans living there um, and the people that were living in Germany that weren't part of the Nazi um, Nazi dictatorship of, of Germany, um, the ones that were there under Hitler's rule that didn't want to be there um, it, it wasn't very good for them. So, uh, Opa immigrated to, to Canada in the 50s, I believe, and my Oma followed him, and they, they ended up landing, I believe, in Calgary. So, uh, th this rifle um, is is part of, I guess, my family's past, and um, it's pretty pretty important to me. It's been I've had it now since 2004, and I've, I've shot quite a few. Um, quite a few elk and, and deer and it's got one moose <laughs> but that was that was just by chance there's not as much moose up here as it was like 20 years ago uh, a lot of hunters from different parts of BC come up here and it's and and the wolves and stuff that have moved in and, and everything and it's changed the population numbers so I don't really hunt them anymore but I'll go in uh, in depth a little bit with this rifle into the history um, so Opa came to Canada and he didn't really have much with him. He's basically starting out in life. Um, and when he and my Oma started a family, um, that's how he fed his family was by hunting. Um, beef and beef and uh, other stuff from the grocery store was expensive and he loved the outdoors. Um, my great grandpa in Germany was a um, game warden and that's what Opa wanted to be, I guess, for a long time. And he ended up being a carpenter. Uh, he did. Uh, framing houses, and he hung vinyl siding. He was a cabinet maker, um, and he loved um, he loved anything to do with woodwork. So, and he was really good at it. It was one of his big gifts um, gifts that he had in his life. Um, a little bit about this rifle. Uh, he did originally shoot a 303 British, and he realized that he might want a little bit more power, a little bit more oomph, and uh, a little bit of longer reach than the 303 British could provide him. So he started looking around at rifles and there was a Texaco station in Calgary and yeah Texaco station don't ask me but I guess back then um, they used to have a service station and then beside they would have um, kind of like a hardware store or an outdoor store where you could buy different things. Um, a guy by the name of Roy Stahl was or I guess you would pronounce it Stahl he was in um, he was in Calgary. He owned the Texaco store at that time, and Opa had been looking at um, different 7mm rifles, um, and he was interested in this one. But there was two rifles that were sitting on the shelf. There was this particular rifle and one sitting next to it, and Opa said um, he was wondering why this rifle was a little bit more expensive than the other rifle. I believe it was a hundred dollars or or whatever it was back then uh, in the 60s when he bought it. And Roy said, well, you know, you're the first one to notice that, and you're the first one to ask. He said, this one here uh, has a barrel with a 1 in 10 inch twist on it, and the other barrel, or the other rifle, has a 1 in 12 inch twist on it. And, of course, Opa said, oh, I'm not sure what that means. And he said, well, a barrel with a 1 in, one in 10 inch twist will, will shoot a little bit faster, 
and it'll stabilize heavier bullets. So Opa started thinking about it. He said, okay, well, I'll think about it. And um, him and Oma always had a really good relationship with purchases and stuff that they made. They made them together. And and uh, so they thought about it and prayed about it, and they went and bought this rifle. So it fed the family for the next um, basically 20 years, I guess. And um, it was one of the better purchases, I guess, that he ever made. So... He was really happy with it. Uh, one of the first stories that he told me, um, he bought the rifle and then he said, and then I bought a box of shells. And he said the, the shells were just about as much as the rifle even back then. So um, when he saw the price of the of the um, uh, cartridges, he bought the reloading equipment because he did the math and, and being a frugal German, he figured out that, well, I could reload for less than half of what they're asking for a box of shells. So... Um, his original reloading book was a Hornady uh, handbook, and you'll see that in the second video that I put out here, but um, it's kind of funny. He thought that he could reload for half the price and stuff, so he bought the reloading stuff and, and started reloading for it. And um, the first couple boxes that he had, actually I'll show you one of the boxes, one of the original boxes that he had um, for the for the 7mm Weatherby. So... Um, one of the first times, I guess, he took it out, one of, I guess, his, his hunting partner, um, one of his best friends, his name was um, Hunt Schultz, and he still lives in Calgary. Um, I guess, to my understanding, my Oma told me that he had a, a stroke um, not too long ago, and at Opa's funeral, I got to meet Hans, and he was, he was a really neat old gentleman. Um, I actually really liked him, and I got to hear some of the hunting stories uh, about Opa there. Um, after he'd passed away, Opa wasn't Opa wasn't a very proud man. He didn't he didn't open up a lot or brag or anything. He would share stories, but um, <clears throat> he wouldn't brag about himself. So I guess uh, the one story that sticks there's two stories that stick with me. The first one uh, about the Weatherby, Opa was with Hans Schultz, and they were in the Kananaskis country and they were hunting elk. And so on this elk hunting trip that they'd gone on. I guess um, Hans and Opa went up um, this mountain range and Opa says, well, he says, Hans, do you want to hunt their, this ridge here? And he says, I'll, I'll just carry on to this next ridge and then we can both sit and watch. So Opa had his lunch with him. A typical lunch was a thermos of coffee in his pack and um, a sandwich for lunch. So he was sitting there having a sandwich and, a, and a, opened his thermos full of coffee and had a coffee and... Um, he said, I looked down, and all of a sudden, there was a big bull elk staring at me. And he said he was about 150 yards or so. And so he, he put one in the chamber, and and he let him have it. He said, that was his words. I let him have it, and boom, nothing. He walked away on me. And I thought, oh, and then he, I guess he's, he wasn't really panicking, but he got pretty excited. He thought, oh, this damn thing. He says, I just bought it. That animal should have been on the ground. So he shot this elk, and he's waiting. He said, well, I'll just wait a few minutes. So he finished his sandwich, and he says, well, I don't know where it went. And I was looking at my binoculars, and I couldn't see I couldn't see him in the bush. I guess he was sitting on a ridge, and the elk had gone down around the corner, and he couldn't pick up the elk from where he was at. And he said, I finished my cup of coffee, waiting for him to stiffen up down there. And then all of a sudden, he comes back, and he looks at me up the hill again, so I let him have it again. I shot him, and nothing. So he thought, i got to go figure out what's going on down there. So he went and looked, and he climbed down that ridge to the bottom of the valley, and there was two dead bull elk sitting there. So it was pretty lucky for him that both Hans and him had a tag because he shot two bull elk that morning. <laughs> One shot, I guess, right in the shoulder for each of them. And uh, I guess the story went that he said, well, Hans, which one do you want? And then... Um, he says, well, no, you shot, you get to pick. And the, the set of antlers that he had from that first elk there that he'd shot were just beautiful. Um, they were kind of in a heart shape. They went really wide, and then they came sweeping up and then curving in at the top. So that was, that was a pretty neat story that he told me. And the other story that he told me, um, he was shooting, it was in the wintertime, and he had snowshoes. And back then, like we think we have it hard hunting now, but there was four feet of snow, and they'd be out all day on snowshoes, and they were sleeping in the back of a travel-all van. And 
that was really roughing it when you think about roughing it now we have wall tents with um, wood stoves and we've got fifth wheel trailers I've seen guys haul them out into the field I still consider it roughing it having a wall tent and a wood stove to come back to it at night but um, their idea of roughing it was a a double layered uh, down sleeping bag sitting in a hammock with a tarp over you in the winter time or in the back of the travel all and temperatures being minus 20 out elk hunting in the, in the Rocky Mountains so we don't have it quite as rough as they did but um, it's it's sure pretty neat when you hear some of these stories of these old guys that have gone out hunting and what we have now and the second story not a very long story he just went out um, he was on his own and he saw a herd of elk and the whole herd of elk went over the hill and there was one cow that was in behind and he was really desperate for meat that year so the only thing around him um, in this uh, valley was this little pine tree and he had rested his rifle on it and the way he was sitting in the snow with his snowshoes he couldn't move because the elk was looking right at him but he said this elk was a long long ways away and um, he looked through his binoculars and yeah it was a cow so he could shoot it uh, the bulls were closed at that time I guess and so he took a shot he said I put it way over her shoulder and I could just about get it there and the tip of my rifle was on the tip of that branch and you all know that shooting with uh, with a barrel on a branch is a bad idea anyways because it, it messes with the harmonics of the barrel but he took a shot and the elk went down and he and he walked up to it and it took him quite a while to get there because where he was shooting from was on the side of a creek and then on the other side in the big valley that's where the elk was so he had some work to do um, but he said it was if he had to say a distance it was over 600 yards so and, and that was shooting uh, 154 interlocks back then just a cup and core bullet so um, yeah some pretty interesting stories over the years um, that he had to to share there before he passed away and um, I guess Ope is one of the people that I think about every day. I miss him a lot and the legacy that he left is something to be definitely remembered. So this is one of the original uh, boxes of Weatherby ammunition that that Opa left me uh, when he left me the rifle. And you see the price of it there $16.98 and that was back in I believe the 70s when he bought this. So <laughs> it was still expensive back then uh, but you can see the bullet names have changed and stuff. Uh, ultra velocity 154 grain uh, soft point bullet is what they called it back then but if you look at the um, ammunition it's still the same 154 interlock I'm pretty sure if you were to pull this bullet it would be 154 interlock but it's still got that uh, weather resistant uh, priming sealer stuff on it there from the factory these are some of the original factory rounds that came with it I don't know if you can see them in there <clears throat> these ones were the ones that some of the cartridges there that, that he'd fired through the rifle. Some of them still have the primers in it, some of them don't, but those are some of the original ones, original factory ammunition. You can see his loading loading data there, the stuff that he reloaded. October 8th, 1978, um, Weatherby, his primer was a 250, 48, 31 powder, and then he had 70.4 uh, grains of powder, and he took it down to 68.9 the way he explained it to me ah you know those rifle cases are a little bit hard to get out of that rifle so he had to knock the powder charge back a little bit but he loaded 15 of them I don't really think Opa understood hand loading the way we do now I don't think there's that much information out there um, I don't think he thought that the load like the powder charges were something that was supposed to be tweaked at all I think the data that was in the book if it was 70 grains or if it was 68.4 that was all you could use and and nothing else so um, I mean as we understand it now those loads are meant to be tweaked with and played with and primers meant to be changed out and but back then I don't know what they had for reloading equipment or any of that stuff so I can't really speak to that but um, looking at his papers and stuff that he'd shot at he kept every single paper from every fall that he went out double checking his rifle and his groups were pretty fine so um, his results were were good and definitely the freezer always spoke for itself in their home so um, going through the rifle a little bit this is the original stock um, that the rifle came with when he bought it in the 60s and I had refinished it uh, three years ago now I believe 
and I went up to a trip. I went on a trip up in the mountains to um, what's the name of it? When I went to a trip, uh, what was the name of the uh, the Turnigan River? It's up. It's up in northern BC there, and went on the Kachika and the and the uh, Turnigan, and I ended up beating it up quite a bit. The stock got a little bit beat up, and um, you can see some of the some of the scrapes and stuff from being up in the alpine and that rough stuff and I decided that I'd gone through the painstaking process of of sanding this whole thing down the checks and everything here and it, it is a really comfortable stock but I didn't want to wreck it so I decided to keep this um, I keep it in my gun safe I'm not going to get rid of it it's original to the rifle but I just wanted to kind of preserve it because it was getting beat up and didn't think that was really fair so ended up uh, ordering a stock here from uh, Profit River Firearms, and this is a Bell and Carlson's, um, just a drop-in, uh, drop-in stock. And I guess right, these days, um, uh, the stocks that the rifles come with now, the Weatherby rifles, that's what uh, comes on it. Bell and Carlson stock. So the, the rifles action is really super smooth, smooth, like really, really, really buttery smooth. Um, I shot. When I shot, um, when I took that elk uh, two years, not last year, two years ago, out of this, um, I jumped shells in and out of impulse rifle pretty just quick. Um, it was just loading pulse, but being, for me, reloading rifle like reloading in the quality is just such an old, um, the machining I have newer ready, this thing I have uh, Unreal. I have got lever rifles and stuff, other uh, Rugersons, but this, and um, actions, this either be did bolt axe. This was whatever we're with this a really good action naturally smart here it was the way an idea in and up stops here but it's just half quick really smooth. it's really the only smooth on side say with this right is pretty only down yeah i was like 11 pounds if it's 10 heavy i think it's in four ounces around it's it's pretty and i don't really notice this i carried it for so long that uh, the weight doesn't really bug me well, i'm a big guy and I, I can take the weight don't really notice it too much I get, uh, so that was one of the modifications that I did to it was the Bell and Carlson stock. It's the uh, it's the OG green with the uh, black spider web, and I did put a new uh, scope on it with Weaver style mounts, and I put these uh, scope covers on it as well. Um, they're just the loophole scope covers. They're insanely priced. I don't know what the markup is on them. They're aluminum scope covers, and they do fit right on these scopes. Um, I believe I paid $180 Canadian for these um, at Wholesale Sports while they were still open. Um, but they far surpass, like I would say they far surpass um, Butler Creek scope covers. I, I went through quite a few different sets of those things and they just rip off in the bush. and It's kind of frustrating. They'll rip off and then your rifle's full of leaves and, and moisture and stuff and it sucks when you when you hold it up and you don't really have anything out there in the field with you to um, clean it up but um, besides this rifle being my my opas um, I'm not a brand loyal kind of person but I do I do definitely appreciate I gotta get something to open this trap because it is so stiff um, I don't I do appreciate good quality um, like the spring everything on this rifle is just like new. I've kept pretty good care of it, and Opa definitely took good care of it. Um, but this floor plate here, like everything on the rifle, operates just, just like it's new. Um, yeah, it's just one rifle that I really, really enjoy shooting. The recoil's not not really bad on it. I definitely don't flinch. I just sold a um, what was it? It was a 308 Norman Mag by Alpine Firearms Co. and I sent it out to um, a local sporting goods store here to get a fiberglass custom stock on it and I had the thing um, I had the stock bedded or the barrel bedded and I did all this work to it and then I went to go fire it and it, it lightened up the rifle quite a bit and when I went to shoot it it kicked so hard um, I couldn't help but flinch every time I shot it so um, I put over $1,700 into the rifle and I ended up selling it and then this thing is the only thing I've shot since so I never did take the 308 Norma um, hunting at all 
Um, this rifle I've packed with me in the bush uh, since 2004 and it's definitely been uh, my companion through thick and thin. It's been through snowstorms with me, um, rainstorms. Every fall it's gone miles and miles and miles. It's gone miles up and miles down and sideways and everywhere and it's it hasn't let me down yet. Um, I've never missed anything that I've pointed it at um, and I've never needed to take um, a follow-up shot with anything except for the elk that I got two years ago. Um, actually he's right he's right here. That was the only time that I needed to take uh, more than one shot because I was so excited but um, it was a it was a pretty nice elk <laughs> but he was screaming at me in the bush there and I just thought well I don't want to let him go so I just kept shooting until until he hit the dirt in front of me he was 30 yards in front of me screaming but I didn't really need the follow-up shot I just did it because I was excited but <clears throat> um, rifles definitely been a a great companion for me and um, I don't believe I've ever had a misfire with it once. The only work that it has ever had done to it, I believe, um, Opa told me a story. They got pulled over um, because they were hunting in the Kananaskis and they were at a check stop and it was a game warden. He asked to see the rifle and the game warden took the rifle and he cycled the action on Opa and rifle and he fired the firing pin drop order snapped the firing on it on it so he replaced Opa had a rising firing pin only work and he had to that but as far as it no that's the um that's ever been the barrel done to still an expedition got the gut is look at it the limp condition um <laughs> smith was still an expedition there's no pick fast in or the barrel side of its condition or i've been pretty happy thing with it i don't know if it's something that was sitting on the shelf um, i don't back in the 60s if it would be something that i would have bumped I don't really know why um, Opa was a big fan of the rifles, but I do know um, when when him and his family bought something, it was of high quality. And whether it be um, through their ad campaign and stuff and through that process, um, they did a really good job of advertising their rifles. And, of course, their um, proprietary rifle technology has always been... Uh, bigger and better and quicker mostly uh, velocity for the cartridges and I don't know I guess I guess I am kind of a stickler for velocity as well I mean if you can push it faster why not uh, faster isn't necessarily always better but um, that's how they made their made their success I guess was through their ultra fast and they they were the first as far as I can tell from books I've read and stuff about um, uh, books that I've read about velocity and stuff they're the first that coined the term magnum and then from then on I guess it was uh it was a term that was used for the 7mm Remington the 300 Winchester and, and as soon as you put magnum on it's like the gods have touched it and all of a sudden it's a it's a supercharged any or whatever but um, it's not too much thing different than the other 7mm shoot you can push this used to pretty quick on my low um i don't stop shoot as much as i did though once i found a load was for it and then doing it so much i do want to shoot the barrel on it and have to and lose get a new barrel the and then serial number and then stamp and everything so, so taking good care of it like i'm probably going to sing on it out here this i have to get reblued because that is the fin ended up wearing on it quite to get from where i have it all the time which is so that will be probably on the schedule here the other thing that I like about this rifle is this safety that's on the side of the bolt. And I haven't, I've looked, I've looked at different safeties and stuff for these rifles. And I haven't found a safety that's quite like this one, that's shaped like this one. It's a super stiff safety, but it's so quiet when you take it off in the bush. And it's super stiff, so there's no, there's no real hazard or danger of setting it off in the bush, which is something I really appreciate too. So if you're just sitting there, you can have one in the chamber when you're out hunting. Um, you find your spot in the bush, walk a few kilometers, and go find a spot where elk are frequenting. And you can sit there and call and have one in the chamber, and then just have it on safety if you're hunting by yourself. And it is so slick to just take off and uh, pull your shot off. It's it's uh, it's pretty handy to have. Um, I guess I should probably tell you guys the only other modification I did set the trigger pull. Um, it was really stiff when Opa gave it to me. I guess he didn't really mind 
Um, I, of course, you don't touch the sear adjustment for these things, but I did adjust the trigger down to a two and a half pound pull. <clears throat> um, and then I set it back up. So it's at three pounds now. Um, it was at five and a little bit, but it's down to three pounds now because you know, man was that thing I fit stiff. <laughs> and I'm not shooting with. I can shoot, um, and I can shoot, but I'm ambidextrous with my right right eye or left hand. I know I'm very right, pulling off my dominant little bit to the right. But because I was so I was pulling a little bit hard shots a little bit, but right, it's I pulling on that trigger, relax it once on that trigger. Look, I know once I things are getting close. Tension, I wasn't pulling to the right a bit more, but it's my group. It's just a beautiful sorry, rifle. My friend did any shot at. Um, every one of them has really liked it. It's not because they're trying to get on my good side. I don't think they actually really do like it. Um, but anyways, that's that's basically all I can really say about the rifle. Um, if you guys are looking at getting one, it is a good all-around performer. I think for myself, if I was to buy a rifle these days, I'm a really... Uh, one of my friends, uh, Kyle, he has a 308 or he's got a 300 Winchester short mag. And for whatever reason, I really like that rifle that he's got. I believe it's a Tika. But um, if it wasn't the 7mm that I had handed down to me, I don't think I would... I, I probably wouldn't buy one. Um, it's just nothing really stands out to me about the cartridge. Um, I was just fortunate enough that Opa gave it to me, and I learned about it, and now I know what it's about. And I definitely, definitely love the rifle. But um, guys that are looking at the 7mm, I would give it a shot for sure. No pun intended, but... I would definitely look at the 7mm Weatherby as a performer in your category. It'll take anything on the North American continent. Um, 175s for Grizzlies. I don't care what you guys say in the comments section. Um, <clears throat> I don't say I don't say any of this stuff without knowing it. I know they do take Grizzlies. It might not be the ideal rifle. I wouldn't want to shoot one with a 7mm. I'd rather have a 30 cal for sure. But I know that if I have taken them before and taken um, I was up against it, you probably wouldn't have I've shot at all with it to um, usually um, drop like a black bear's looks for anything else. They just drop it, sack of brick, take the alt and any or anything pointed to have high. It's not this in it with shot at rifle, but I do sure it would drop confidence in a north of my place. But I'm pretty sure if anything, yeah, America, another rifle to shot uh, for a hundred. Um, if it would be a three padded wind mag shoot or a three hundred three hundred Winchester short mag. So, aside from that. If you want to give the 7mm weather be a try, um, you can watch, or if you have one, you can watch these next videos here about some of the loads that I came up for it, um, some of the stuff that I did with the load development. And uh, anyway, I, I hope you guys like the video and hope you like the stories. Uh, it's just a little bit more in-depth history of this rifle that I can share with you guys. So if you guys are interested in any of the reloading or the load development for this thing, um, you can look at the... Uh, second and third parts here in this video series but thanks for watching keep